I am indeed going to be talking about DuoRAM, a bandwidth efficient distributed ORAM for two and three party computation. I don't know why this isn't working, so I'll use my keyboard. Or there we go. So I am Ryan Henry. I am a professor at the University of Calgary. This is joint work with my former student, Aditya Vatapalli, who's about to be a professor at IIT Kanpur. Or, yeah, I think that's right. And uh, my former advisor, Ian Goldberg, who's at uh, University of Waterloo. And indeed, this is another distributed ORAM talk. Um, we're kind of attacking ORAM from a slightly different perspective than the previous talk, so I'm going to go through a little bit of the history and how we got to where we are and why we're attacking this from the direction that we are. So back in the 80s, we had the original ORAM construction. Uh, we already heard about this, so I won't say too much about it. But over the years, things got progressively more efficient. So we had uh, we went from like square root communication and computation per access to logarithmic communication and computation per access. These things do this by having some state that is held by the client that they use to uh, assist them in interacting with the server. And then when we fast forward a bit, we see suddenly the asymptotics are getting worse again. And the reason for this is because people have a renewed interest in trying to put, put uh, ORAM protocols into MPC protocols, and it turns out a lot of the techniques that were used to get really low asymptotics just don't play very nicely with the cost models in MPC protocols. And so um, at CCS 2017, um, there was the flow RAM construction that was referenced earlier. It sort of threw out the playbook for how people were doing ORAM and kind of went back to basics and found something that works concretely much better for reasonably small memories in, a, in an MPC setting. And we are building upon that basic idea that uh, was behind flow RAM, but with some new tricks to bring communication costs down about as low as they're ever gonna get. In fact, I can almost confidently say they're not gonna get lower in the online setting versus what we have, um, while still having this relatively poor computation complexity, although concretely this is big O N, very cheap operations, so until the database gets quite large, it performs quite well in practice. Okay, so going back to the CCS 2017. So this was the flow RAM construction. It was really nice, it won a best paper award, uh, very high quality work by Jack Dorner, Abby Shalott, I was really excited because it uses all of my favorite cryptographic primitives. You guys must like these things too because you are in this room, which is about most of these things. So it uses some private information retrieval, it uses some PIR writing, it uses some garbled circuits, it uses some distributed point functions. Um, and basically it's a very beautiful bit of cryptographic engineering. On the other hand, it doesn't break any barriers and I really like breaking stuff. So I, I thought, let's, let's try to go with this and break some barriers. So back to the problem at hand, we're trying to do ORAM in an MPC setting. So we have memory, the memory is a bunch of fixed size elements, each element has an index or a, an address, and the goal is to be able to access one element from the memory in an oblivious way. So think of this index, um, this, this element, or the index of this element as being data dependent, dependent on the secrets that the MPC is trying to hide, and we want to nonetheless fetch the specific bit of data that it's referring to. And this example was already used, but imagine binary search, we should coordinate uh, in these sessions, I don't know. Ima imagine something like a binary search. Um, if you're trying to implement this in an MPC, you typically, um, it's hard, right? So you have a bunch of comparisons that are based on your secrets, and the outcome of the comparison tells you to jump to one or of two different addresses, and if you leak which address you jump to, you're leaking information about your secrets. The normal trick in an MPC setting when you encounter a branch is you just follow both branches and ignore the one you didn't want to follow, but in something like a binary search, this is clearly not a very good solution because each of those branches branches and each of those branches branches and you ultimately end up with a very con convoluted linear scan over the data and you might as well have just done a linear scan over the data at this point. All right, so back in, uh, in 2017, Dorner and Chalat had this neat idea. They said, okay, there's this new primitive called distributed point functions. They let us send around these special vectors that we need to use very compactly. Why don't we use those to get low communication costs and then use some very simple PIR and PIR writing techniques to implement the oblivious reads and writes from the database. 
Uh, the issue that they encounter, though, is that when you do PIR writing, you end up with a secret shared database. And when you try to do the reading, you don't want a secret shared database to read from. So they reconstruct the database in a encrypted form. And now we can easily do PIR over that. And then they just have a clever way to come up with the key you need to decrypt the thing you just fetched. The issue, of course, is that this reconstruction part has linear cost and you don't want to do that. So then they go back to some of the tricks that did exist from these more asymptotically efficient schemes. They use a stash and this uh, same sort of reasoning, a square root ORAM, to amortize the cost over uh, multiple queries. So they do this reconstruction once every square root or so queries and therefore you get an amortized cost of about square root n communication per query um, and concretely quite fast. Okay, so what's our secret? What are we gonna do different than them? We're going to not worry so much about, well, I don't, maybe shouldn't say it that way. We're going to be strategically leaky, right? We're gonna try to just sort of not reconstruct the database and do an MPC based, based inner product to fetch the thing we're looking for, but we're going to be very strategic about what we try to hide when we do this. And what do I mean by that? So here's a folk theorem, it's not even really a theorem, I've never seen it written down, but sort of people who work in this area, it's sort of intuitively obvious that something like this must be kind of true, which is that if you want to compute the inner product of two secret shared vectors, you kind of need to do something like linear communication. So you blind the two vectors or something and then you exchange these blinded vectors and you're effectively doing something like uh, Floram did, except now you have to do it for every inner product and we've actually done something counterproductive. And so the intuition is we've got two vectors, each of them has n secrets in it. We have like two n secrets to hide, so we need like two n blinds and we need to exchange stuff and this is gonna be very costly. Whereas in reality, when we're building an ORAM, we don't just have two secret vectors, but rather we start off with an empty vector. So there's no secrets here, there's nothing to hide. When you start a program, your RAM for that program is empty. It's during the execution of the program that stuff gets put into RAM. The next piece is when it's time to read from the database, one of the two vectors we're gonna compute an inner product with is almost public. And what I mean by this is it is a secret sharing of a very specific vector, the vector that is all zeros except for a one in some location. So if you don't worry about which location is the one, that you actually realize these two parties got the same vector, or at least like maybe one of them is the negation of the other, but they have almost the same thing. So we don't have n things to hide, we have like log n bits worth of information that we actually need to hide which of these entries is different. And when it comes time to write to the database, we see that, okay, one of the two vectors we wanna be able to compute inner products with has changed in one location, but otherwise it's the same vector. So not much has changed. So we basically have like a little bit more to protect against. We, at no point do we ever have n fresh secrets that we need to somehow hide. Okay, so again, everybody knows the database at the beginning. That means that the initialization for our ORAM is literally just allocate some memory and zero it and you're done. Um, and we're gonna, try to basically protect precisely what needs to be protected, right? Whenever a write happens, we need to protect where the write happens, that's log n bits worth of data. We need to protect what gets written, that's big O1, uh, because we're assuming each memory location holds a fixed size word. And whenever a read happens, again, we just have like log n bits worth of information that needs to be hidden from the servers when we do this. And so we came up with a, neat inner product protocol and then built our ORAM around it. So how many of you are familiar with how you would do an inner product using like the generalization of beaver triples? Is this a common knowledge in this area? Okay, so we're basically taking this protocol. If you don't know it, it doesn't really matter. I can't go through this in detail because I would never have enough time anyway, so I'm gonna kind of just give you the highlights. Um, but the way that it works is both parties start with, share, with shares of their vector. Some third party or pre-processing uh, produces some value that is going to help them. So basically what they each have is they each have their, their shares and then they each get a blind that they're gonna use to blind their share. They're gonna exchange the blinded shares. So now they each have their own share, their own blind and a blinded copy of the other guy's shares. And then there's one other value that they use to fix any little bits that don't quite work out when you try to do arithmetic on these blinded things. 
So what we're gonna do for our first step is introduce a third server, which we'll ultimately be able to remove if we want at some performance height. Um, and we're going to initialize with these three values. So rather than having these new blinded things be exchanged every time, we're gonna try to just start with simple ones and then update them as we go and never have to exchange them and thus avoid the whole linear communication part of the protocol. So at the beginning, we have these shares. These are, as I mentioned, the database is zero. We don't need to hide the fact that it's zero. So these shares start off as all zeros. We also have blinds and blinded copies of the database. But again, because we have nothing to hide, these are all just zero. So basically each of these two servers uh, at the bottom are our two main parties. They each hold three things, each the size of the memory. And then our third server, the guy that helps us out, has two things the size of the server, which are just the blinding factors that the other two have. And these all start at zero. And then we have a interesting way to do the queries that allows us to simultaneously write to the database while updating these values or read from the database using these values, uh, all without having to do that linear communication step. And so the way this works is, I'm gonna write these as just like I'm sending vectors around, but keep in mind these are distributed point functions and they're very small, short vectors. Okay, so we start off by sending the, this is for a write, by the way. We start off by sending the vector that you would expect. It's just a standard basis vector. It's got zeros everywhere, except for the thing we want to write is in the ith position, and we give two shares of that to these two servers. But then we also have more of these um, shares floating around, so we actually have three different sharings of the exact same vector, and we distribute them amongst these servers in a uh, replicated secret sharing-esque sort of way. So the, the helper gets one share from two of the different sharings. So it's basically getting one share in common here with this guy, and one share in common with this guy. And then what we do with these is we're using the observation that, say this uh, sharing and this sharing, the zeroth and oneth share, are the exact same vector except for one entry where they differ. And that one entry corresponds to the place where we just did the right. And so Basically, the first guy is going to update his database by adding something, and the other guy is gonna update his database by adding that share. And then we're going to use the next one to update the blinding factors that we have. And as you can see here, they, because they have the matching shares, one of them is going to update the blinding factor with his share, and the other guy is gonna blind, or update his blinded database with the matching share and get something that is almost the correctly updated thing. And then we're gonna leverage that third party to fix the part that we slightly got wrong. So basically the database shares are, are already updated correctly. The uh, random thing that we have in common with party two is definitely updated correctly. The question is just, okay, uh, I'm just gonna skip through the super fast. I didn't actually expect to talk about it too much anyways, so um, I, I'm just gonna skip the correctness. It's, it's not very interesting, but if you look at this, it all sort of works out. They actually have the thing they want, and then when you go to do a read, we're using the fact that this guy, who is normally, if you were gonna do like a two plus one or a server-aided two-party computation with beaver triples, would normally return values that have to do with R0 and R1. We're just going to include them in the query for the queries for a read, we send two copies of this vector and we do the similar sort of replicated secret sharing type thing. And that third party does an inner product and sends something which allows us to fix the, the error that arises when you try to do your inner product without having to ever exchange that linear thing. Okay, so then that all works out. And the upshot of this is that it's actually surprisingly fast in practice. Um, these graphs are kind of hard to see because there's so many lines floating around. But the thing I want you to, to notice here is as we decrease the bandwidth, flow RAM gets really slow and duo RAM doesn't notice. When we increase latency, flow RAM gets really slow and duo RAM doesn't notice. And when we increase the database size, they both get slower, but we can actually get it quite large before they get troublingly slow. In the paper, we also have a bunch of other tricks. We take the logarithmic communication that you just saw on the slides and we move it all to a pre-processing phase. So in the online phase, we send the same amount as you would in like the most private, the most uh, efficient, conceivable, non-oblivious, just we send the address and the thing you wanna write and nothing more. Um, we also have a CPIR-based way to get rid of that third party and have a fully two-party protocol. And yeah, that's it. So 
I'm done. You can ask questions. <laughs>